Hi, I'm Sebastian Porcelman, a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School's Center for Bioethics. My background is in philosophy, experimental psychology, and neuroscience, and I'm interested in the intersection between these fields and individuals and societies. Some areas, such as today's topic of cognitive enhancement, can be viewed from many different disciplinary angles. What works and why? Is it safe? Is it legal? Should it be legal? Ought we to enhance ourselves? What about other people? Should they be using these technologies? And how will it impact our society over time? Can we help prevent bad uses while we encourage good uses? Or should we leave the decisions to each individual regardless of the consequences? The answers to such questions must draw on a diverse body of knowledge and values drawn from brain, the brain and social sciences as well as the humanities, and they are thus a good example of a neuroethical issue. In the first part of this lecture, I will introduce cognitive enhancement and the evidence for its efficacy. This part will give you a science-backed and safe techniques that you can use to improve your brain function immediately. In the second part, we will discuss the use of drugs to enhance cognitive function, focusing in particular on stimulant medications and the ethical issues associated with their use by healthy individuals. The lecture's final part will look at technologies which are currently in development, not yet shown to be safe or effective, but which do raise interesting philosophical questions due to their immense potential for the future. So, what are we talking about here? Cognitive enhancement refers to anything that causes an improvement in cognitive functions. There are three main categories of cognitive enhancers. Lifestyle changes, drugs, and technologies. Before we begin by discussing the evidence behind these methods, let us consider what we mean by the terms cognition and enhancement. Cognition is a general term for the mental processes by which we perceive, understand, and engage with the world. Cognition is thought to be composed of several different functions. For example, to benefit from this lecture, you must first engage your attention, which enables you to focus on the information presented and filter out other currently irrelevant data like your email and Facebook notifications. Next, to make sense of the information selected by attention, which in our example is this sentence, you have to keep track of the relation between consecutive words and slides and integrate these into a meaningful, coherent whole using your working memory. To make use of this information later, you have to be able to retrieve it. And for this to happen, it must first be stored in your long-term memory. Finally, you can plan to make use of this information in the future by engaging your executive functions, which, beyond planning, is also used to refer to the abilities to organize, manage time, and keep track of several concurrent tasks. Like executive functions, these cognitive functions can themselves be split into subcomponents. Memory, for example, is often partitioned into subdomains of verbal, spatial, and episodic memory. Cognitive enhancers are aimed at improving all or some of these functions. In practice, cognitive enhancement strategies often have varying effects on different cognitive functions. Similarly, it is possible to have specific deficits in some but not other cognitive functions, as is often the case in traumatic brain injury or neurodegenerative diseases. For example, damage to the frontal lobes, in this case caused by a tumor, may lead to difficulties with planning, organization, and impulse inhibition, all of which are executive functions. On the other hand, damage to the temporal lobes can cause selective impairments in memory functions. A famous example of this is patient H.M., now known after his death to be Henry Malaysen, who had a bilateral medial temporal lobectomy, which resulted in the removal of two-thirds of his hippocampi, as well as large portions of surrounding brain tissue. Henry was an interrograde amnesiac and was unable to form declarative memories after his operation, living perpetually in the moment, though he retained much of his memory of what had happened before the operation. The term enhancement is actually quite contentious to define. 
It can be used broadly to refer to any improvements in cognitive functions above the level enjoyed previous to the use of the enhancement. Alternatively, it can be used narrowly to refer to improvements beyond normal levels, where normal indicates standards for humans generally or for the particular person involved. The reason this distinction is important is because it may have consequences for how we regulate access to cognitive enhancers. Many people believe that enhancement, in the narrow sense of improving function beyond normal levels, is not an appropriate goal of medicine. On this view, medicine is concerned specifically with therapy, that is, the restoration of previous healthy functioning, rather than with enhancement, that is, improvements beyond the previous level. In this lecture, we will use the broad definition and examine the ethics and efficacy of, of proposed methods for the improvement of cognitive function at any level. So what are these cognitive enhancers, and is there any evidence that they work? The strongest evidence for cognitive enhancements to date are found in studies of the cognitive impact of lifestyle factors. For example, sleep deprivation, inadequate sleep quality, or disturbed sleep patterns severely affect cognitive functions, especially sustained attention or vigilance. One study found that moderate sleep deprivation can lead to a reduction of up to 50% in performance in some cognitive tests, which is comparable to the cognitive effects of severe alcohol intoxication. On average, cognitive impairment is seen in those who sleep an average of six hours a night, as compared to those getting the recommended seven to nine hours. A recent meta-analysis estimated the effect of sleep restriction on various cognitive functions, though it must be noted that the 61 included studies varied widely in design and quality. The effect sizes on various tests of cognitive functions can be seen in the third most left-hand column under the heading G. Interestingly, there are also deficits among those who sleep too long, that is those who get an average of 10 hours or more of sleep per night. Those who sleep too long or too little are also at a greatly increased risk of dementia and cognitive impairment. If you belong to one of these categories and if you suffer from daytime sleepiness, modifying your sleep patterns to achieve seven to nine hours of sleep regularly per night is one of the safest and the most effective cognitive enhancement strategies available. Similarly, naps have been shown to improve cognition. Longer naps lead to longer lasting improvements, and it appears that the afternoon is a particularly effective time to nap. The improved efficiency associated with optimal sleep patterns often makes up for the time lost in sleeping longer. For example, it has been shown that adolescents perform better when they start school later and thus get more sleep, even when the additional time is not added to the end of the school day. In this case, less really is more. Physical exercise is another highly effective cognitive enhancement strategy. Although the scientific evidence for its efficacy is relatively recent, the relationship between exercise and cognition has been recognized at least since the time of Socrates. There is a great story written by the contemporary dramatist Xenophon in which Socrates comes across an out of shape acquaintance. You look as if you need some exercise, Epigenes, says the great philosopher. Well, I'm not an athlete, Socrates, comes the reply. This seems to strike a chord for Socrates' answers. In everything that men do, the body is useful. And in all uses of the body, it is of great importance to be in as high a state of physical efficiency as possible. Why, even in the process of thinking, in which the use of the body seems to be reduced to a minimum, it is a matter of common knowledge that grave mistakes may often be traced to bad health. And because the body is in a bad condition, loss of memory, depression, discontent, insanity often ensail the mind so violently as to drive whatever knowledge it contains clean out of it. But a sound and healthy body is a strong protection to a man, and it is likely that a sound condition will serve to produce the effects the opposite of those that arise from bad condition. Besides, it is a disgrace to grow old through sheer carelessness before seeing what manner of man you may become by developing your bodily strength and beauty to their highest limit. But you cannot see that if you are careless, for it will not come of its own accord. 
Socrates was a war hero, acting as a hoplite in the Athenian army and being distinguished for great bravery. But he was not the only great philosopher to have noted the importance of exercise. His most famous pupil, Plato, whose name literally means broad in ancient Greek, was a two-time champion wrestler at the Isthmian Games, the qualifying rounds for the Olympics. More recently, physical exercise has been shown to improve global cognition as well as nearly all of the individual cognitive functions across all age groups studied. This slide shows an excerpt of a collection of systematic reviews and meta-analyses from a database I am compiling for a book on the subject. The effect size of physical exercise is similarly impressive as that seen in sleep-deprived individuals switching to optimal sleep patterns. In addition, epidemiological studies indicate that those who exercise have much reduced risk for dementia and cognitive impairment. It appears that aerobic exercise, such as endurance exercises, running, swimming, and cycling, is most effective, but that combined aerobic and anaerobic, that is, weightlifting or resistance exercise, is yet more effective. In addition, the benefits seem to follow a dose-response curve, such that the more exercise you do, the better it is for your brain. The effects of exercise on cognitive function are both acute, that is, immediate, and chronic, which means that it is effective over the long term too. Studies on acute exercise have shown that medium and low intensity exercise confers immediate positive benefits on attention, memory, and impulse inhibition, whereas high or maximal intensity exercise can impair cognitive function on tasks attempted right after the exercise session. Chronic exercise appears to benefit all cognitive functions though there isn't enough data to make strong statements about the modulatory effect of exercise intensity. The full citations for these studies are available upon request through this email. Recently, evidence has emerged that meditation significantly improves cognitive functions, though much of this research is still younger than you and me. Again, the effect appears strongest for those who have meditated the most and involves both acute and chronic benefits including on general mental health criteria. Meditation can even change the structure of the brain, for example, by increasing the ability of the frontal lobes to inhibit activation in the amygdalae, or increasing interoceptive and empathic awareness through gains in insular volume. Cognitive benefits have also been observed in nutritional studies, though the evidence is less solid in this area. Many studies have focused on individual nutrients, things that might be extracted and sold in pill form. But a healthy diet consists of a wide variety of whole plants, fruits, nuts, legumes, tubers, and grains, each of which is a category of thousands of individual foods. And each of these foods is filled with thousands of active components. It makes little sense to study one such chemical in isolation, unless we are worried about nutritional deficiencies or interested in the basic science. Rather, Cognitive enhancement is likely to occur when a person moves towards a more generally healthy diet. Unfortunately, it is rather difficult to get people to change their eating patterns for any considerable length of time. So studies in this area are not as advanced as the potential knowledge to be gained would warrant. Nevertheless, some impressive early efforts have been made. For example, Northstone and her colleagues created an index of processed versus non-processed and health conscious versus non-health conscious eating patterns and scored the dietary pattern of a cohort of three-year-olds accordingly. They found that a standard deviation of processed food intake was associated with a 1.67 point decrease in IQ at age eight and a half. A standard deviation towards the health conscious eating pattern was associated with a 1.2 point IQ gain. Other studies have found that the Mediterranean diet a pattern of food intake rich in fish, vegetable oils, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, and low in meats and processed foods is associated with improved cognitive function. In addition, excessive weight and obesity are associated with decreased cognitive function and increased relative risk of cognitive impairment and dementia, though these effects are largely reversible when the excess weight is lost. Finally, Sociality, active learning, and time spent in nature have all been identified as potent cognitive enhancers, though we don't have the time today to go into the details. 
Although lifestyle factors tend to have the greatest effect sizes, their use as cognitive enhancers is largely ethically uncontroversial. Those who wish to make themselves smarter by exercising, meditating, getting enough sleep, eating right, and engaging with novel skills in a large, diverse social network, especially in nature, can do so without fear of ethical reprimand. By contrast, the use of the other two categories, drugs and technology, is often called into question, especially when the individuals using them are not cognitively impaired to begin with. The heightened focus on the ethics of pharmacological and technological cognitive enhancement is a product of the before-mentioned discussion concerning the aims of medicine and the distinction between therapy and enhancement. We will begin by examining pharmacological cognitive enhancers, that is, drugs, which have been shown to increase performance on one or more validated measures of cognitive function in at least two properly conducted randomized controlled trials. We will also touch upon the currently available cognitive enhancing technologies using a similar approach. Finally, we will look at something called radical enhancement, that is, enhan enhancements far beyond anything that we recognize as human cognition. You may be intimately familiar with some of the vibe variety of such drugs in current use. For example, coffee, tea, and even nicotine. Though please remember that the health effects of smoking are so deleterious that you ought not consider its use for this purpose. Since these are legal and to a large extent culturally sanctioned, ethical discussion of their use has usually centered on their health effects and whether their use damages others as is the case with second and third hand smoke, or whether and how their use ought to be addressed by public health measures. The ethics of pharmacological cognitive enhancements focus particularly on a group of stimulant and atypical stimulant drugs. These drugs are used in the treatment of cognitive impairment, but they work equally well in healthy individuals. Although there are dozens of such drugs in development and many more in use, we will focus on three in particular, Methylphenidate, maybe better known under its name, uh, under its uh, trade name Ritalin. Mixed, amphetam mixed amphetamine salts, also known as Adderall, or perhaps better known by its street name Speed. And last but not least, Modafinil, also known as Provigil. These are the most frequently used cognitive enhancing drugs, not counting caffeine, nicotine, and theine. But first, let us take a quick detour to the legendary city of Oz by way of introduction. And I quote, Upon a river which wound through the grounds, several crews and racing boats were rowing with great enthusiasm. Other groups of students played basketball and cricket, while in one place a ring was roped in to permit boxing and wrestling by the energetic youths. All the collegians seemed busy, and there was much laughter and shouting. This college, said Professor Wogglebug, complacently, is a great success. Its educational value is undisputed, and we are turning out so many great and valuable citizens every year. But when do they study? asked Dorothy. Study, said the Wogglebug, looking perplexed at the question. Yes, when do they get their arithmetic and geographra and such things? <laughs> oh, they take doses of those every night and morning, was the reply. What do you mean by doses? Dorothy inquired, wanderingly. Why, we use the newly invented school pills, made by your friend the wizard. These pills we have found to be very effective, and they save a lot of time. Please step this way, and I will show you our laboratory of learning. He led them to a room in the building where many large bottles were standing in rows upon shelves. These are the algebra pills, said the professor, taking down one of the bottles. One at night, on retiring, is equal to four hours of study. Here are the geography pills, one at night and one in the morning. In this next bottle are the Latin pills, one three times a day. Then we have the grammar pills, one before each meal, and the spelling pills, which are taken whenever needed. Your scholars must have to take a lot of pills, remarked Dorothy, thoughtfully. How do they take them? With applesauce? No, my dear. They are sugar-coated and are quickly and easily swallowed. I believe the students would rather take the pills and study, and certainly the pills are a more effective method. You see, until these school pills were invented, we wasted a lot of time in study, 
that may now be better employed in practicing athletics. Seems to me the pills are a good thing, said Ombi Ambi, who remembered how it used to make his head ache as a boy to study arithmetic. They are, sir, declared the Wogglebug earnestly. They give us an advantage over all other colleges, because at no loss of time, our boys become thoroughly conversant with Greek and Latin, mathematics and geography, grammar and literature. You see, they are never obliged to interrupt their games to acquire the lesser branches of learning. It's a great, in it's a great invention, I'm sure, said Dorothy, looking admiringly at the wizard, who blushed modestly at this praise. We live in an age of progress, announced Professor Wogglebug pompously. It is easier to swallow knowledge than to acquire it laboriously from books. Is it not so, my friends? Some folks can swallow anything, said Aunt M. But to me, this seems too much like taking medicine. This story, now more than a century old, highlights many of the topics that are raised in contemporary discussion of the ethics of pharmacological cognitive enhancers. We can see the similarity by comparison to a recently published study which reviewed 40 surveys of public opinion concerning the acceptability of and reservations towards the use of pharmacological cognitive enhancers by healthy individuals. In their review, Kimberly Shelley and her colleagues found that the responses of the public to their surveys could be grouped into three broad categories, medical safety, coercion, and fairness. The last category, fairness, is composed of three separate sub-themes, equality of opportunity, honesty, and authenticity. Interestingly, these are also the most common topics in the academic debate. In the world's largest and newest survey on public opinion, the American Association of, Re of Retired Persons commissioned a piece of research likely to be of great interest to their 37 million members. They asked a representative sample of Americans questions concerning enhancements of various kinds. The results for cognition were quite interesting. 95% of the respondents felt that it would be appropriate to use drugs to restore cognitive function in those with dementia. And 88% agreed with the use of implantable devices for this purpose. By contrast, only 35 and 31% respectively thought that this was acceptable for cognitive enhancements going greatly beyond normal human capacities. As is usually the case, there is a slight twist to the story. When asked whether they would be personally interested in making use of such technologies, 43% said yes, though only 34% were interested in implants. Remember, approving of something for others is not the same as approving of your own use. Just look at Yoda. But before we turn to these ethical questions, let us briefly introduce the three aforementioned drugs of interest. Methylphenidate, or Ritalin, is a medication used to manage the symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD. Methylphenidate works, to block, works by blocking the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, two key excitatory neurotransmitters. This causes more norepinephrine, or adrenaline, as it is known in Europe, and dopamine to be available for use as neurotransmitters. Because both of them are involved in alertness, concentration, and motivational salience, this translates into a greater ability to stay focused and awake, which in turn translates into improved scores on measures of cognitive function. Similarly, mixed amphetamine salts, or Adderall, speed, works by causing a greater release of dopamine and norepinephrine into the synaptic cleft thus increasing the availability of these neurotransmitters by different means. The outcome is similar, with those taking mixed amphetamine salts at low doses generally experiencing increased task-related motivation, as well as greater levels of arousal and wakefulness. It appears that both methylphenidate and amphetamines, although generally considered well-tolerated, can increase the risk for cardiac events. One retrospective study found that prescription stimulants for ADHD sufferers was associated with a 20% increase in the relative risk of serious hospitalization for cardiac events compared to non-use. In addition, there is some abuse potential and a risk of addiction when larger doses of these drugs are used. There is a story about the famous mathematician Paul Erdos, 
were used to consume copious amounts of amphetamines to help him focus and increase his productivity. For Erdos, at least, this was a highly effective strategy. He holds the record for the largest number of lifetime mathematical publications at a whopping 1,500 papers. One day, a colleague worried about Erdos's health made a bet with the mathematician that he could not abstain from amphetamines for a month, implying that his use was due to addiction rather than the professed reason of increasing mathematical contribution. After the month of abstinence was successfully completed, Erdos said to his friend, congratulations, you have managed to set back the progress of mathematics by one month. Our last drug of interest for today is called modafinil, perhaps better known under its trade name, Provigil. Unlike the previous two drugs, modafinil is indicated only for use in sleep-related disorders, including narcolepsy in both Europe and the United States, but also sleep apnea and sleep shift work disorder in the latter country. Narcolepsy is a condition characterized by severe disruptions in sleep-wake cycles, which leads to extreme daytime sleepiness. One way to think of narcolepsy is as follows. If you fall asleep during my lecture, that is more or less normal. But if I fall asleep during my lecture, that's narcolepsy. The mechanism of action of modafinil are much more complicated and less well understood than our previous examples. Beyond weakly affecting dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake, modafinil also has been found to elevate histamine levels and affect other neurotransmitter systems, including the seroton serotonin and orexin. Interestingly, some of the most important effects may lie in the ability of these chemicals not only to increase task-related focus, but also to increase task-related motivation or even enjoyment. In qualitative research, Users of these substances report feeling increased levels of feeling up, being driven, being interested, and enjoying the task at hand. Unlike the pill swallowed by the students at the Royal Athletic College of Oz, which immediately impart knowledge, much like when Neo in the Matrix receives a martial arts patch that instantaneously grants him mad martial arts skills, Current methods of pharmacological and technological cognitive enhancements do not directly convey information to the brain. Rather, they allow the user to stay focused for longer and better retain the information that they have learned. Nevertheless, this certainly is an advantage, and because it is so, questions have arisen over the fairness of their use, especially in competitive settings. The key questions here are whether the advantage conferred by the use of such drugs constitutes cheating, is unfair in other ways, is unsafe, or could lead others who do not wish to use drugs to take them against their will in order to compete with others who do in fact use them. These are highly important questions since surveys demonstrate that anywhere between 1 and 33 percent of students, up to 20 percent of academics, and a significant number of professionals use or admit to using these substances. In addition, several US colleges and universities have banned their use, apparently without inquiry into the ethical appropriateness of doing so. So, what can we say about the ethics of pharmacological cognitive enhancement? Let us start by examining the medical safety of these drugs. We have already noted that methylphenidate and amphetamine have known cardiova cardiovascular health risks but the risks of modafinil appear to be lower. Modafinil is considered to be well tolerated, does not appear to increase the risk for severe cardiac events, nor does it possess significant addictive potential. However, there are at least five cases of Steven Johnson syndrome, a very severe skin condition, and a single case of death due to multi-organ hypersensitivity, the only such case, to my knowledge, that have been reported. To give you an idea of the exact medical risks involved, let us consider a study by Castez and his colleagues, in which the authors retrospectively examined all modafinil overdoses with follow-up to known outcome reported to the California Poison Control System over a decade. No cases of high clinical severity, 11 cases of moderate severity, and 54 cases of minor severity were reported. The most commonly reported side effects are insomnia, headache, nervousness, nausea, and hypertension. Recent meta-analyses investigating the safety and efficacy of modafinil in psychiatric conditions 
have also concluded that short-term use is generally safe and well-tolerated. Because the general consensus is that medicinal use is well-tolerated and somewhat safe, at least in the short term, my own work on the ethics of cognitive enhancement has focused on modafinil as the apparently and currently best case of pharmacological cognitive enhancement. However, there are three important and very serious caveats to this. Firstly, since modafinil is a scheduled substance, there are legal barriers to its use. Thus, trying to obtain modafinil may expose users to legal risks, which in turn can have severely negative effects on their health. To avoid such risks, those seeking to obtain modafinil, methylphenidate, or amphetamines often turn to internet-based gray markets. Because quality control, professional standards, and high-quality ingredients in laboratories are not always to be found in such unregulated markets, those who obtain pharmacological cognitive enhancers face the risks of deliberate or accidental contamination. Such contaminants can pose very serious medical risks. Others choose to obtain quality controlled substances either by prescription diversion, that is, purchasing off of friends or suppliers who have a legitimate prescription, or else by faking symptoms of ADHD or narcolepsy in order to gain a legitimate prescription themselves. Needless to say, prescription diversion can have deleterious consequences for the prescription holder, and symptom faking can undermine patient-doctor trust, which similarly can lead to negative outcomes for the patient, the doctor, but also everyone else, because these factors undermine the accuracy of diagnostic statistics. Luckily, these risks can be entirely removed by simple changes in drug policy. It is also very important to note that modafinil is a relatively recently synthesized drug, which means that there are no data whatsoever on the safety of long-term use. It is possible that modafinil might be safe and well-tolerated, but only in the short term. Another important point to keep in mind is that the health effects of pharmacological cognitive enhancers depend upon how they are used. Those who use these drugs to chronically reduce their quantity of sleep face serious risks due to the associations between sleep deprivation, chronic disease, and all-cause mortality. Although, as you can see, it can happen to lecturers too. Increased productivity and motivation could be used to make time for nurturing relationships, meditation, or exercise, all of which are associated with a host of beneficial effects on health. It has been pointed out that the way that academic work is often carried out, sitting alone, inside, is likely to be physically harmful, so steps to reduce its duration may be beneficial for general health. Although there is little scholarship in this important area, anecdotal evidence suggests that some users of modafinil use its effect to work longer whereas others seek to increase efficiency to free up time for other activities. A second important ethical issue is that of coercion. Some of those who do not wish to use drugs, like modafinil, might nevertheless have to do so or feel pressured into doing so because they do not want to fall behind their enhanced competitors. Coercion refers to being forced or pressured into doing something one would not otherwise have done or wanted to do. At one extreme, there is explicit coercion, that is, rules that explicitly state that somebody must do something or else they will be punished. Examples include laws and institutional rules. Some worry that the use of pharmacological cognitive enhancers will end up being forced on people in this way. At the other extreme, indirect coercion does not involve explicit statement of rules, but can nevertheless exert as strong a force on a person to act against their wishes. There might be no rules obliging a person to take, say, modafinil, but indirectly, they might feel pressured into doing so simply to catch up or keep up with their colleagues. The coercion here arises indirectly from the undesirability of the alternative. In a recent survey, students stated that they would in fact be more willing to take a hypothetical cognitively enhancing drug if half or all of their peers were using it, relative to a condition in which few or none were. In general, respondents in qualitative studies have indicated that pharmacological cognitive enhancing drug use should be an autonomous choice. Students in one focus group viewed these drugs as a lifestyle choice governed by personal values, but also as an understandable reaction to academic and social pressure. 
The tension between these two views could lead some to take drugs in order to cope with academic or social pressure, even if absent such pressure, they would not want to take these substances. Similar factors could lead faculty members to use pharmacological cognitive enhancers against their wishes in order to keep up with their colleagues. Explicit coercion is, in theory, simple to avoid. One must not require an employee to use potentially harmful drugs unless there is a very good reason to do so, as, for example, there might be for military radar monitors or pilots. If such rules exist, the problem can be addressed by changing the rules. Indirect coercion, including peer pressure, however, cannot simply be removed at the policy level, and is thus a legitimate concern. There have been several studies on the extent to which indirect coercion could influence others to use pharmacological cognitive enhancers against their will. In one survey of more than 6,000 Swiss students, 98% of those who had used pharmacological cognitive enhancers mentioned competitive pressure, and only 2.8% cited other people's use of these drugs as a motivating factor for their own use. In another survey of more than 1,500 German university and high school students, 5.7% responded that they would take these drugs if their employers recommended this, and 7.5% would use the drugs if their friends were using it. In a third survey, only three out of nearly 1,500 respondents mentioned social pressure as a reason for discomfort with pharmacological cognitive enhancement. Nevertheless, these numbers may increase as the use of these drugs becomes more prevalent and the concerns of those affected must be taken into account. An important thing to keep in mind here is that some level of pressure to perform well is not necessarily a bad thing. I never would have done my homework in school if there had been no such pressure. In contexts such as education, medicine, transportation, science, politics, and public health, which are of the utmost importance for the advancement of all humankind, pressure to perform well can be a good thing insofar as it promotes the kinds of activity that save and improve lives and the planet. In addition, peer pressure to make use of the previously mentioned lifestyle cognitive enhancers can be good insofar as it promotes physical health and well-being and better cognitive function. However, competitive pressure or indirect coercion is more problematic when it is directed towards harmful or counterproductive activities. To give you an example, I was once speaking casually with a colleague and the topic of working hours came up. At my colleague's workplace, there had been a change in management and the new bosses expected employees to work overtime as a matter of routine and pride. This meant that many employees faced a difficult decision of giving up something very precious to them, such as sleep, time with their families, or friends, or hobbies, or else losing out relative to those who were willing to sacrifice their free time. As the level of danger or harm involved rises, the ethical problem of coercion becomes correspondingly weightier. Since the weight of this concern will vary by the type of drug used, we can't make any blanket statements about pharmacological cognitive enhancers as a whole. Rather, we need to examine their risks on a drug-by-drug -drug basis. Coercion is problematic because it undermines the ability of individuals to choose for themselves, or in other words, it does not respect the individual's autonomy. This is an important point because placing limits on the type of cognitive enhancers individuals may use is itself strongly coercive. Therefore, it requires very strong justification. In the case of modafinil, the health risks appear not to be so severe as to justify a ban on paternalistic grounds. The side effects of modafinil are comparable to or less than many things we would not wish to ban. For example, high levels of caffeine consumption or the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin. But some ethical questions remain even for safe and effective pharmacological cognitive enhancers. These involve questions of equality of opportunity and more metaphysical concerns, such as the effects of enhancement on personal identity, the work ethic, and enhanced individuals might be seen, uh, enhanced individuals might be seen as less authentically the creators of their own work, or even as cheating others by using these pills. As mentioned above, access to pharmacological cognitive enhancers is limited to those who have a prescription, 
or are able to fake one or get some off prescription holders or those who are willing to deal in the gray and black markets. These are surely problems of inequitable distribution. However, an informal search reveals that medafinil pills, to take one example, are not more expensive than a cup of coffee, at least when ordered in its generic form from an online pharmacy. Although it is true that legal barriers are likely to disproportionately impact the poor, disadvantaged, and those of non-Caucasian ethnicity due to well-known issues of structural racism and law enforcement, these barriers to access are also addressable by changes in public policy. Perhaps more importantly, there is some evidence to suggest that the benefits of pharmacological cognitive enhancers are even greater for those who need them the most. Some studies have found a greater eff effect of modafinil and methylphenidate in lower IQ participants. Those starting from a lower baseline of dopamine and noradrenaline may experience more of an effect from modafinil, whereas those that start from a high baseline may have less to gain. If this is the case, Broad access to modafinil and similar drugs could lead to less inequality and in cognitive capacity. In addition, qualitative work has found that students who have the greatest problems with exam anxiety and procrastination are also the ones most likely to use pharmacological cognitive enhancers. Some of these students might rely on these drugs to finish their education. At any rate, Fair access is more easily achieved in the case of cognitive enhancement by modafinil than in cases of cognitive enhancement by private tutors, expensive private schools, after-school activities, or the luxury to have enough time to attend to enhancement by habits such as meditation and physical exercise. If we do not wish to ban these practices on the grounds of inequality of access, we would be inconsistent in doing so for modafinil and drugs alone. Another worry is that the use of pharmacological cognitive enhancement is inauthentic. In this vein, the 2003 President's Council on Bioethics, chaired by Leon Cass, argued that excellence achieved through the use of drugs is, quote, cheap, by way of obviating the need for hard work and study, and not fully authentic because the excellence is partly attributable to the drug rather than to the individual. Correct attribution of merit is of the utmost importance in academia and many professional fields because it is a standard against which promotions, tenure-track positions, prizes, awards, and other accolades are judged. Michael Sandel argues a similar point in a different context. As the role of enhancement increases, our admiration for the achievement fades, he says, or rather, our admiration for the achievement shifts from the player to his pharmacist. We can understand these sentiments in many cases. For example, we would not take kindly to a member of the Royal Athletic College of Oz boasting about their detailed Latin knowledge. But imagine instead that the students at that college use their enhanced abilities to make new and greater discoveries, protecting themselves and others against death and decline. We might not praise them for the mastery of Latin, but surely they deserve recognition for using their skills in a way that advances learning and benefits their society. This last point brings us to an important question which has been much neglected in debates over the ethics of cognitive enhancement. Many people carry out work or hold responsibilities that directly affect the lives of others. Examples include politicians, soldiers, doctors, teachers, academics, judges, juries, scientists, engineers, air traffic controllers, pilots, and perhaps many others. Do people in these and related professions not have a professional duty to enhance their capacities? For example, the first line of the Hippocratic Oath is primum non nocere, first do no harm. Yet many doctors, especially junior ones, work such intense hours that it is not physically possible for them to get seven hours of sleep, as well as carry on a healthy lifestyle. This means that doctors are often carrying out their duties under conditions that have a similar impact on their cognitive functions as several alcoholic beverages. Knowing this, would you willingly consent to being operated upon by a surgeon who has been called in after a 24-hour night shift or is similarly impaired in other preventable ways? And yet, such information is not standardly listed on consent form. 
Similar remarks may be made for political figures, police officers, teachers, and any other professionals whose cognitive prowess severely affects the life of others. We have focused on the ethics of pharmacological cognitive enhancers because the evidence for their safety and efficacy is relatively well established. Research into cognitively enhancing technologies is still in its infancy, but it is worth mentioning quickly some promising candidates. Transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, is a technique in which a device is used to deliver a targeted electrical current to a specific brain region. Since an important part of neurocommunication uses electrical signals, the idea is that artificially stimulating certain brain regions could increase the effectiveness of neural communication. Since neurons that fire together wire together, as Donald Hebb famously wrote, this could in theory lead to stronger neural pathways in desirable areas, which in turn could enhance cognitive functions. Another technique, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, works on a similar principle. A large, powerful magnetic coil resembling an infinity loop is passed over the brain region of interest thereby causing a change in the electromagnetic field and, it is hoped, increased neural activity of the right kind. Another potential for enhancement might involve physically intruding upon the brain. With the advent of CRISPR and Cas9 gene editing, future generations may benefit from manipulation of genes implicated in, co in cognitive function. It should be noted, however, that as of this lecture, there are zero candidate genes for such intervention. Or to be more precise, the genes that have been correlated with intelligence and cognitive function exert near negligible effects, and independent replication studies have had little success in validating even these disappointing findings. However, we know that intelligence as measured by IQ tests do have a heritable component. So future efforts involve involving more advanced genomics methods, especially in combination with other omics approaches, may be successful in identifying modifiable pathways for cognitive enhancement. Indeed, there are other technologies which may have tentative potential for such use. Deep brain stimulation, which involves the surgical implantation of an electrode to a targeted area of a patient's brain, is currently used to treat severe and otherwise intractable neurological and psychiatric conditions. The technology is extremely expensive and very dangerous, but it can also be highly effective. In the future, it may be possible to use deep brain stimulation to stimulate or dampen activity in regions of the brain relevant for cognition. In a related vein, brain computer interfaces, or BCIs, is a group of technologies which enable their users to control an external object, usually a computer or a robotic limb, using their thoughts alone. One example of a BCI in current use enables patients with locked-in syndrome, that is, total paralysis but largely intact cognition, to control a speech output program by thinking of a specific area or activity. The pattern of neural activation associated with this thought is recorded by electroencephalography embedded in a helmet and then translated into a command. Although these are already amazing feats of technology, the concept may well be extended in the future to allow for more rapid or parallel computations in healthy brains with obvious potential for enhancement of cognitive functions. Intriguingly, such machines might also be used actively, that is, Rather than passively enhancing the computational power of a brain, a brain-computer interface could also import entirely new patterns of activation. To take a benign example, imagine a world-class surgeon monitoring a particularly difficult surgery happening halfway across the world. Now imagine that this surgeon spots a potentially fatal error in the making. It is not inconceivable that she would have the power to override, inhibit, or directly change the activation pattern of the other surgeon about to make an error such that disaster is avoided. Similar applications could be immensely useful for educational and rehabilitative purposes, but the potential for abuse is clear, a problem we will discuss after our next example. Recently, researchers succeeded using similar techniques in connecting the brains of several rodents, thus creating a sort of supermind known as collective consciousness. The team showed that the combined neural resources of these rodents significantly outperformed the efforts of any individual rodent on the use on the same cognitive tasks. The same team managed to wire up the brains of three monkeys, allowing them to, to collectively maneuver a detached robotic arm. This is reminiscent of the hive mind, and even more interest, interestingly, 
it is actually reminiscent of what goes on in our own brains every day. When esteemed neuroscientist Michael Gazaniga and colleagues showed two different pictures to split brain patients, that is, persons who had undergone surgery to remove the corpus callosum, the wiring that connects the two hemispheres of the brain, they discovered something truly shocking. Each hemisphere was able to respond correctly to questions related to the image shown to it, entirely independent of the other hemisphere. That is, they had a mind of their own. These unrelated experiments have convinced some that our own mind is in fact a collection of separate consciousnesses working together to achieve a greater whole. If you will allow me to take a further speculative step into an uncertain future, it may be possible to connect several human minds together to achieve an even greater whole. This would constitute a sort of ultimate democracy or wisdom of the crowd with the potential for cognitive powers far beyond anything any individual could achieve. And, yet more speculative still, such cognitive networks might be connected to artificial intelligences or supercomputers capable of facilitating human neural networks. Since we are decidedly in the speculative domain here, the ethical ramifications of such developments are not entirely clear. Nevertheless, some dangers are obvious. If brain-computer interfaces can be used not only to speed up our own cognitive processes, but also to cause externally induced and controlled modulation of neural activity, the dangers of mind control and mind reading cease to belong to the realms of science fiction. There is nothing in theory stopping nefarious agents from hacking and controlling these devices, meaning that the concept of slavery could take on a whole different dimension. In response to these unrelated problems, Andorno and his colleagues have proposed the introduction of four new human rights, cognitive liberty, mental privacy, mental integrity, and psychological continuity. As if this were not enough to mull over, there are two additional, possibly even more dystopian factors to consider. We can thank the Australian philosopher Nick Eger and the Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom for raising these important points. Eger's worry concerns what he terms radical enhancement and involves complicated questions of moral status. Very briefly, moral status is what determines the way in which we may treat other beings. On the one hand, a rock has no feelings or cognition and cannot be hurt in any way. Therefore, we need have no moral qualms in treating a rock in any way we wish, provided that it doesn't belong to or is used to harm somebody else. At the other end of the extreme, human beings have full moral status because it is possible to harm them in many ethically meaningful ways. Humans are sentient, we can feel pain, frustration, and love, and we can plan for the future. In addition, we are responsible for the advancement not only of humankind, especially our kin and friends, but also all other life on Earth. Because of this, we cannot simply kick or throw a person as we might a rock. In between these two extremes are the various animals, and some say plants, that, share, that we share our wonderful world with. Elephants, for example, share many of the features that make humans morally important. They are responsible for, and do indeed care for, not only their offspring, but also their kin and friends. They feel pain, frustration, longing, and many other emotions that we as humans recognize. And they can live long and fulfilling lives. Other creatures may be closer to the rock end of the spectrum, but they still have moral status in proportion to the extent to which they exhibit morally relevant capacities. The question then arises of what happens when we tinker with or modulate such capacities. And doing so is not so far-fetched as it might seem at the first glance. In 2013, Steve Goldman's lab successfully enhanced the cognitive abilities of mice by engrafting human glial cells into their brains at an early stage of development. These mice outperformed their litimates on all cognitive tests given. The white arrows and the pictures point to fully integrated human glial cells in a mouse brain. Taking this line of thought to its logical conclusion, Agar asked what would happen to the moral status of being so enhanced that they could no longer be compared to human levels. For simplicity, let's imagine a superhuman with off-the-scale IQ, unimpeachable empathic facility, and purity of motivation, with a massively extended lifespan. Under many theories of moral status, such a being would be as superior to species typical humans as we are to mice. Would such beings be justified in using species typical humans for scientific experiments? After all, 
The only reason we consider ourselves justified in using non-human animals for agonizing and fatal experiments is that they have a lower moral status than us. After the slogan, if it has to be done, it had better be done to them. Agar calls this the problem of radical enhancement. And in the worst case, this problem might lead to several separate species or levels of humans, somewhat comparable to colonial age slavery or caste systems. Nick Bostrom has raised similar concerns in a different context. He worries that artificial intelligence, once sufficiently advanced, will obtain the power to radically enhance itself. This could lead to a similar subordination of species typical humans, that is, beings like us. In a related vein, we might wonder whether we have a duty to enhance the cognitive powers of non-human entities. If we had the power to grant such things, would it not be cruel to withhold the advanced powers of thought, empathy, and understanding to other creatures, whether they are carbon or silicon-based? Anyway, there is much food for thought here, and I hope that this lecture has helped you recognize some of the many nuances in the debate over cognitive enhancement. To recap, Allow me to restate some of the major points, conclusions, and unresolved questions. There are many uncontroversial, ethically uncontroversial methods of cognitive enhancement involving lifestyle changes which you can and ought to avail yourself of. You should be aware of the extent to which others, especially service providers, dependents, and loved ones could benefit from these enhancements. Secondly, several drugs have been shown to be effective in enhancing cognitive functions in healthy individuals. Especially in the case of modafinil, the safety risks and other ethical considerations are not so severe as to justify a paternalistic ban on their use. How these drugs are used has important implications for the health effects and the effects of their use for other people. Thirdly, there are several technological means of cognitive enhancement in early stages of development. There is tentative evidence for the effectiveness of some of them, and it will be interesting to follow these developments. Very few data on their safety exist. Thank you for your attention.